So it is my great pleasure to welcome Kathy Jory to LinuxConf Australia today. Um, she has an amazing history of work in open source, in networking, and recently in IoT, and is currently at Mozilla. And she's going to tell us about what the buyout of Arduino means for the open hardware movement. So everybody, please help me welcome Kathy Jory. Thank you, Emily. And uh, coincidentally, since I submitted this talk when I was unemployed for that time, uh, I am now working at Mozilla, which is where Emily works. So that's a nice coincidence. Uh, first, I have to give credit, really, for this talk. Uh, it's my first Linux conference Australia. I didn't know what an amazing conference this would be. But uh, one of my undergraduate friends from the University of Minnesota forwarded me this tweet that Kathy Reed had done in July. Um, and I literally took her tweet and turned it into the title of my talk as I ha was just leaving uh, the Arduino.org side from that buyout. So I have my friend Tom Marble from college and, and Kathy Reed to, to thank. Um, I'm going to start with just the, the, the buyout slide is literally this slide. And once I get through that history for you all, then I'll go on to the more optimistic side of, of open hardware. But basically, where things started, and I don't know how many of you have heard this history, but uh, a guy named Hernando Barragan was doing his master's thesis at, at an Italian design institute in Ivrea. And uh, he had the concept of he's at a design institute. He happened to be technical enough to know how to work with microcontrollers. He selected one of the Atmel ones that had an open tool chain. And he, for his master's thesis, literally did a few design revs of a board. He called the project wiring, had 25 boards made. They evaluated it in the classroom with the artists and designers. And it was a huge success, so much so that you know, his thesis advisors and some other students started helping out. And they, they ordered 100 of these boards to, to actually do a class, you know, whole classes where these artists and designers, basically non-engineers, could use microcontrollers to activate lights and change sound and do all these things. And his, you know, the wiring approach, basically digital read and write and analog inputs and writes, uh, was formulated completely with that thesis. And these 100 boards on the picture here, you got Gianluca Martino, Martino and Daniela Antoinetti. And uh, Gianluca had been helping the school with the manufacturing of these boards and then uh, you know, at, at this company, and then they founded Smart Projects SRL because they felt like it was going to be successful, like more people would want these boards. And it turns out, after Hernando left, went back to Bogota, Colombia, where he continues to be uh, the dean of the School of Design and Architecture down there, and he's still very much an interactive design um, professor and, and researcher. And he left, and then Massimo Bonzi, Gianluca here, uh, and a couple others, one of the students, David Mellis, formed Arduino. Um, and that, so that brand, Arduino, they got started and started in the education realm to, to push out these, these ideas. Um, Hernando, again, continued with what he had called wiring. So the little orange W was wiring, and then, and then Arduino continued. And they, they actually you know, took shared code, but they were sort of independent. And as you know, the, one of those two brands become popular, and uh, that would be the Arduino brand. And so back in about 2008, I guess, the, some trademark jockeying, there was some internal strife between some of the co-founders, John Luca in particular, who, who had started the Smart Project SRL to do all the manufacturing sales. Daniela was the financial person. And um, there was st starting to get anxiety over who who deserved more value, basically, now that they were a growing success? And they started having trademark. So John Lucas uh, got the trademark in, in Europe, and Massimo got it in the US, and then there was a legal battle. John Luca, being a hardware designer, didn't like the legal battle. He met up with um, uh, Federico Musto, who I met when I was at Qualcomm Atheros at CES one year, showing off audio streaming through Wi-Fi routers and uh, was interested to see how they were now combining one of the 
Qualcomm Atheros little Wi-Fi router chips that can run an embedded Linux OpenWRT and the microcontroller on the same board so you could do development and drive that data to the internet. It was, that was called the Arduino Yoon. And so I, I kept up with that because the Yoon and then later the Tien were using the Qualcomm Thero chips where I was at the time. Um, Federico decided to take on the legal battle on John Lucas' side, buy out John Lucas' share, and then go uh, again, try to get the trademark issues resolved. He also, Federico, reached out to uh, Hernando Barragan, and Hernando Barragan wrote this very fascinating untold history of Arduino. If you haven't looked at that, it's a long read, but it's, it's pretty interesting. And uh, at the same time, I think that publication of the untold history gave uh, Federico, who had teamed up now with Daniela, kind of the upper hand on the legal battles that were going on. And yet, Fabio Violante, who comes in here, was a colleague uh, of Massimo's from the early days. And Fabio said, you know, you guys stop wasting time and, and money on lawyers battling for these trademarks. Why can't we do some sort of settlement? And I think Fabio deserves a lot of credit for having done the settlement of January of last year. So one year ago, there was a settlement announced. Well, it was announced at Maker Faire the previous fall, but the, the actual paperwork was finished in January of last year, uh, a year ago. And that paperwork signing had this buyout clause that within exactly six months, if either side, there was like a 51 to 49% share, if either side wanted to buy out the other, the terms of that purchase were already agreed upon. So there's the number, just pull out your checkbook or whatever. If you can bring up the money. And so neither side had been able to settle that way, but then they, ha they wanted the opportunity. So that's why the six month window, if anyone does find the money. And I think Fabio has good connections and who knows how it actually, I can't, I can't tell you because I don't know how it actually came together, but considering it was Fabio, Federico and Daniela were on the board of the holding company of the trademarks when they were going through this phase. And then Fabio now is the new CEO of, the, uh, of Arduino that bought out Federico. And Arm was somehow involved, but they won't say why or how because they have two members on the board of directors. So that's kind of the story I know. Where I'd like to see is like, I feel like there's a lot of time and money wasted on you know, the legal battles that ensued. But I'm hoping that through Mozilla, now that I'm involved with there, I really want to see that all that thing development of these microcontroller devices, now that you add con connectivity and at low cost, how can we standardize upon these things, grow them into something more mature, you know, move on. Um, Arduino becomes more of a brand like Kleenex. They're still a company among many, but there's so many great companies doing great things in this area. So that's your history of the buyout in a nutshell, as much as I'm uh, aware. So next I'm just going to go into, well, why, you know, what drives open hardware, what drives open software? And I can tell you, well, Hernando started in the artist and designer, so I'm picking a couple, one of my colleagues, Tania Hurst at New York Maker Faire, um, Antea uh, Russo at, at the Rome Maker Faire, and you can see uh, Tanai actually designed this dress, and, uh, and Teo was boarding it over in Italy, and the guy behind on the right side on the phone, he was one of the designers of this little interface, where basically these five strands of LEDs are controlled through a touchscreen that is sitting on top of a ST micro, STM32 microcontroller, so a 32-bit microcontroller. So you've got artists and designers. Who else? Very strong in education and uh, both the educators and the students. So here again, the drum set is at Dover High School in Pennsylvania. This was shown off at New York Maker Fair. You've got a robotic hand tied to a, uh, sensors on a glove that you can control. That's a, a project at UC um, University of California, San Diego. Uh, the Lollibot was one of the things I did during that mini conf on Monday. And then this uh, line following robot is another project in a box from uh, UC San Diego. So those are big users. Now, other, another big category is makers and hobbyists. And they love to share and show off what they do. So here again, you have a uh, laser cut lamp and the touch screen on top of an actual microcontroller that's controlling the 
the RGB LEDs in that lamp. And then uh, I happen to get together every once in a while, every Wednesday at noon in Redwood City, California, uh, this table here on the left is a, just a bunch of people who are retired or semi-retired or flexible enough to work at work to be able to come together, have lunch, show off their things, and just talk geek like most of you in this room do. And it's really fun, actually. It's really exciting. I hate to always be the only female in that crowd, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's a fun time. And then this middle one is actually a collaboration I have with one of the engineers at Microchip where we designed this project for school and education, and it was kind of collaborative. I was more on the product side, saying how can we do something really cheap with uh, an Arduino Nano, and, and then he, uh, Bob Martin, actually laid, laid this out onto a PCB board, and then we got um, college students to actually solder off little strips and put it all together, and I have another slide later if I have time for that. And then we have researchers and scientists, you know, the university work and the, uh, the Shaw Selby at National Geographic gave an excellent talk at the Open Source Hardware Summit last October in Denver about all his travels into the wild with these sensors and things that they build and they track. And then I saw on PBS NewsHour and I went online and found a clip where this gal in Wisconsin actually designs these turtle eggs with GPS uh, inside. And and the poachers are actually gathering them up and then they track where the poachers take these turtle eggs because they're, you know, they're endangering the species um, because they're a delicacy um, where they're taken and eaten. And then of course, engineers with a passion for open source, people like you, uh, lovely to, to be in this environment where everybody is so open and sharing and enthusiastic about everything. So I copied, I stole a couple tweets from people um, from the crowds from this exact LCA. Now I'm gonna go into uh, a few slides, just a, a bunch of examples of people who are producing or doing really good things in open hardware, in open software, and the types of things they're doing. And this, uh, Chibitronics is actually Bunny Huang and G. G is pictured up here in the corner with, with Better Not Roam Goza, but they do, they're partners on Chibitronics, which is fantastic. I've heard from schools who implement the circuit stickers. Now they're moving on to the chip clip, which, bun, uh, which G is showing. She's showing that to Bernat, and Bernat's showing her his uh, snap for Arduino. So Bernat Romagosa is in Barcelona, and he does snap, snap for Arduino, turtle stitch, beetle blocks, all sorts of uh, block-based, and now working with microblocks, all sorts of educational tools for students that help them interact with the real world and the software world. If, if you've heard Scratch, Snap is like that on steroids. It has all the first class programming um, uh, constructs that you need as well. So you can take it pretty far. And then uh, I, I was really hard pressed to cut out any of what Bunny wrote to me about why he liked hardware. And it was so good that I, I kept it all in there. I'm not going to read it all. But basically, you know, imagine this, as he calls himself, a lone, lonely school kid reading manuals and flipping through information to, to learn these things. And then he also did it, just a great job of describing the value of software, he, where he talks about you know, starting from the Linux kernel, the libraries, the servers, the databases, the container management, content data development networks, um, browsers, continuous integration, source code. You know, he says it's, if we had to pay for this, there's no way we could even get started to build such a fantastically complicated infrastructure with a tiny team of engineers. And he says, you know, we can use the same tools and infrastructure that well-funded companies use. I think that's pretty powerful. And then G on the, on the education side, you can just see the educator in her. You know, I like sharing what I create, seeing where others take it watching them build upon it. She's basically, you know, sees the value of planting that seed and watching it grow. And all those resources are uh, made to educators are. And they're, you know, Chibitronics, a growing company. You've got um, examples like Seed Studio, where they've done a great job, I think, on creating low-cost hardware, uh, um, taking advantage of the openness, uh, the Grove Kit, is really fun to plug in a bunch of sensors and actuators. That re-speaker, uh, which is a hat on top of the right Raspberry Pi, I'll actually, uh, that actually works as a voice controller for the Mozilla Things 
gateway demo that I hope to have time to show you a little bit toward the end here. And uh, Xiaobo, who's one of the engineers there, says, you know, why do you implement? Because we can. And seriously, you know, our vision is to lower the barrier of difficulty to the users, and open hardware is a good way to do that. And obviously, the, the huge value to them is the community and ecosystem. They've built a brand that, um, that really takes advantage of that. He says, he also highlights, you know, on the pro side, he says, you know, we could do better with the tools and technology of, of the development uh, of these um, products. But on the pro side, he says he's enthusiastic about risk 5 you know, in open source architecture. And pointing at Emily, Rust, you know, a new approach to develop um, embedded software with modern, soft, modern technology. Now here's a company in New York, MCCI, that was involved with a lot of USB stuff. Now they're doing little LoRa. LoRa stands for long range. Um, LoRa modules that are battery powered that you can basically, they act like being on a cellular network, but they're sub gigahertz, so they're unlicensed spectrum. And this is becoming popular. These, these modules work with the Things Network. He says, you know, what are the reasons that this, you know, he sells, his customers are commercial customers, industrial, IoT, all those types of customers. The main reasons is, you know, their value proposition to their customer is that we're not going to hold you hostage. Your data is yours. The data acquisition systems, it's important that if we were to disappear, you could still recreate that. And so they don't want to, um, you know, they, they have that obvious uh, image for their customers. They obviously depend on open source. It's Arduino, Docker, Node-RED, Influx, uh, and, and that ensures, you know, they don't have to take the whole burden themselves because they, they use what others do. And they, uh, you know, started, started by using and now are giving back. Um, here's just a couple of other examples. Chipkit, Madmaker Labs is a guy that used to work for Microchip, now coming out with his own boards. Rogue Robotics, Brett Hegman in, in Toronto. These are what these guys have to say. Um, guy McCarthy is just, you know, ethically really strong where he wants to help others while he's benefiting himself. Brett says they do different levels of openness depending on their our products. And then Brett had an interesting improvement idea, which was essentially, you know, open hardware always goes along with some software. And to provide the total uh, value of the openness would be, you know, recognizing different levels of openness for the combined aspects would be a good way to promote how accessible it is. I thought that was an interesting comment. Uh, Rick Anderson is at Fubar Labs. He's a good friend of Brian Schmaltz at Schmaltz House, who's in Minneapolis. Brian, I had to do a clip of his website because they say that uh, the, the HTML website of some of the engineers, how bad it is, reflects how good they are as an engineer. So there's, there's the example of the Schmelz House website. And uh, he's done some you know, fantastic work with these motor, stepper motor drivers. And he, uh, so, so Rick Anderson has the university behind him. He's a professor at Rutgers University. So he's very positive. You know, I work on projects that are tough for one person, so I need to share my ideas, my projects. I need to work at the, in a larger scope. He, and, and from a commercial side, you know, just his advice is getting to market quickly is key. And then he teaches education and entrepreneurship. He says a lot of students will take stuff and try to do things in a closed way, and they realize they, they can't. They just they struggle to, to succeed. But then Brian Schmaltz had an interesting observation where he says for him, open hardware has been really difficult from a financial angle because he's one guy and he's, he's been successful with these stepper motor boards and some other things. He says, you know, sometimes I do it for myself or my customers. But as an example, he says, um, it's been an enormous financial drain where he spends so much time helping people over the phone and sometimes these overseas companies will sell copies that are lower quality, they're not paying royalties, and they expect you know, him to do all the support because he wrote the software for these things. And, and as opposed to legit companies like SparkFun who actually sell and will pay him licensing fees. That's the right model. How can we get, get over you know, the incorrect model? So why does he do it then? Feels like a good thing to do. You know? 
He, he loves to share his designs, enjoy hearing how other people use it, being a part of the community. And then uh, Spark Fun, I got a tour. This picture is actually from the Open Hardware Summit was in Denver, so after the summit, we got a tour of Spark Fun and Lulzbot 3D printer. And, and at Spark Fun tour here, you can see inside their manufacturing and warehouse facilities. What I like about Spark Fun, Adafruit, some of these companies is the great amount of tutorials and education, educational information they, they include. Plus, Spark Fun does a good job, you know, of letting the designer, like uh, Leah Buckley of the Lilypad, her design and color and brand shows through. And so Pete says, you know, open hardware was fundamental. to core value. Um, we were students angry at how many hoops we had to jump through for the privilege of working with various pieces of hardware from what we saw as entitled vendors with regard to software IDs and documentation. And so we found that sentiment to resonate with a large group. To do anything but open just isn't who we are. And he clearly recognizes the value of, of open software around it. So that was my plethora of examples of, of really great people, really great companies or uh, educators. And um, I spent some time, for example, uh, I was at a Theros when they were acquired by Qualcomm. So this first bullet of corporate lawyers and business managers who don't get it, that's been a huge frustration in my career. Um, lots of head banging and like how to explain it. And it's difficult when you've been in these types of communities and you see the innovation, the growth of knowledge and, and so forth, and you get to the companies that they consume and they spit out and they try to make money. And you know they, what they don't realize is that there's actually greater return on investment by being open. But that's really difficult to get across. And my example of that is, for example, the upstream Linux driver F9K that was on a Qualcomm Atheros chip. I pushed hard to keep that open, to keep that going. And after the chipsets, the 11 n chipsets for like Wi-Fi routers were stopped doing any support, any documentation, any anything, they continued to sell them just like cash cows because upstream Linux kernel driver support with no dependence on proprietary firmware it was just they, the IoT picked up these older, cheaper chips and like used them all over the place in, in hubs and routers and IoT gateways and all sorts of stuff. So there really is a huge long tail of, of uh, uh, revenue that you can gain from these. One of the other inhibitors, obviously, that Brian mentioned is the protection against copycats. So how can we make sure that those clones aren't aren't getting out there and, and making it difficult for people who are the smaller companies or, or the individual professional makers to, to make sure they can still make, make money. Because those, those other companies will just undercut and cookie cutter bake these, these hardware solutions and they don't have to have the burden of the software and support behind it. And then uh, you know some of the other, um, you know, figuring out a defense, defensible business model, how can we do that? Well, advertise openness. There's a certification program with Oshawa, um, maybe more of the, the logo, the licenses. I don't have all the answers. That's where people like Karen Sandler come in. But I do know that when you look at the successful companies, you see strong brands. You know, they have to do all the fundamentals well. You can't just be good technically. You've got to have excellent PR and marketing, great customer service global distribution channels, partners, people that sell. You have to make other people successful by, by selling your stuff, by building on your stuff. If other people become successful based on your stuff, your stuff is going to become more successful. And then, of course, the support of the community and industry. And don't forget that last bullet. I've been in situations where all it takes is a little bit of difficulty from the management at the top, and it can really ruin the culture and the moral morale of people who are just fantastic people. So uh, make sure you get in a place with, with positive culture and really strong ethical leadership. Um, and then here's just some more ideas off the top of my head how, how we could do better. If you're in a hardware company, a semiconductor company, or have a chance to talk to them as being one of their customers, Remind them to embrace standardization. Remind them that you know a rising, fly, a rising tide floats all boats. 
you know, by, by collaborating and cooperation with their, with their other industry partners, it uh, fuels the whole industry. I also think they should do more for funding research. Incredible innovation comes out of the, the hardware and software that's made available openly, and then the researchers, the, the students have the time to play and analyze, and you know, the companies just want to crank out and make more. They do a great job with their engineers, but there's so much more follow-up that gets done at a university level. And, um, and you know, just being open means your customers will get to market faster. So they'll actually sell more. And uh, before I go on to a little demo, this is kind of my summary slide here of the open hardware side. It's, it's the right thing to do. You know, I don't see it slowing down. In fact, I'm really excited by Risk V, where we have open software. Now we have open hardware. Now we can go right down into the chip and see what architectures. And the, the Risk V, I think, is really fueling um, software tools and uh, development tools around designing chips. So I think there's going to be another re revolution in the semiconductor industry once Risk V really gets adopted and taught in schools and universities and even high schools. So I'm excited about that. And then um, uh, the idea Brett had of combining metrics, you know, accessibility goes all the way down to the silicon. How can you describe that? How can you show that to your customers? And how can you educate our cu your customers to become conscious choosers about the accessibility of, of your products? So now we're going to do a commercial break and take a look at a new mission that of where I am in Mozilla is a, the IoT team within the emerging technologies. And we're focused on trying to standardize the IoT world out there. The big, the big problem is that most of the IoT stuff you buy today is, is siloed. You buy a bulb from Philips or Singlet or, or IKEA, and they all talk to a little hub, and that hub talks to your Wi-Fi infrastructure router, and that allows it to get out to the internet. And then there's some cloud service you're a subscriber to. And then there's apps you can download for iOS or, or Android. Imagine the cost for each company to have to build that entire value chain. It's just not, that's why the light bulb costs $30 instead of $3, right? So what we want is to, to break that off at the levels of, here's the smart bulb. It speaks the smart bulb you know, API and, uh, and, and stop there. Instead of vendor-specific APIs, have the web of things API that all the smart bulb members, and then you can just manufacture just the bulb. And, uh, and to extend that even further, you as a user, you can't see it scaling where you buy different bulbs and you have to have an app for each one. And, and I'm not just, and that's just the bulbs. Then there's all these other smart things in your home. So it's, uh, hopefully we can, we can continue to push for this. Because um, our vision, really, I love working at Mozilla because the, the values applied to technology is excellent. But we envision, you know, to be open, decentralized use of the internet when we extend now into the internet of things. Um, and so we've embodied that with a project we call the Things, Project Things, and there's a Things Gateway demo that I'm going to do next. And so I just have to escape out of here. And this is a demo that the web page for this is actually running on a Raspberry Pi in James Hoban's house in New Jersey somewhere. Or no, Cambridge. Cambridge, he's in Cambridge. And uh, it's, you know, this is a 0 0.3 implementation, but one of the things you, so he implemented, the reason there's so many lights here is he implemented this color thing where you can actually pick and do different colors. Oh, my color picker came up over here, but anyway. Um, and you can turn things on and off. And of course, it seems really cumbersome from a, uh, from a UI perspective, which is why uh, there ought to be voice controllers and things that you can talk to. And let's see if this will work. Turn on the kitchen. And so that's how you would go about. You wouldn't actually be going about your house finding GUIs to touch and turn things on and off, you actually talk to it. And even though I'm talking to a browser, that Seed Studio re-speaker on top of a Raspberry Pi, we already have that demonstrable as voice commands for, for the gateway as well. And then um, because there's not tons of things in the wild, we have you know, virtual things where you can 
uh, basically it, it gives you an example of the web thing API, the, the software implementation of the standard, and then you can play with it yourself. Um, and so that's been a, a recent, recent thing that just came up this week. So again, we're in the 0.3 release, should be the, later this month, and by the end of the year, hopefully we'll have the 1.0 done. And there's, there's more things in here. There's a rules engine so that you can tie one thing together. He doesn't have any rules. Floor plans, uh, the settings. One of the curious things is that with this Raspberry Pi, you get an SSL certificate right off the bat when you set up your domain. So that's just installed for free from Let's Encrypt. Um, you set up the user, the adapters and add-ons we have uh, for different things. And then we also have adapters for things like uh, Zigbee and Z-Wave, which can't speak native web thing API. Um, and then James actually wrote this OAuth implementation, so authorization, so that you own your thing, it runs in your house, and then you would have commercial access, kind of like you compartmentalize your cell phone, you're asked, do you want to share your location data, do you want to share your contacts or something like that, you would say, you would have to accept, you know, sharing some information, we want to do a good job of, of showing exactly what you're sharing. So, uh, go back here. So I don't want to belabor the demo my commercial break too much, so I'm going to pop back over here. And um, we're going to go on to questions, but I just want to quick fly through a few exciting projects that I just, if I, if I had time, I felt I wanted to get them out there. So universities and different educational programs. Project in a Box is um, a group at UC San Diego uh, that I'm very impressed with, and they build, they use different levels of students to build curriculum for the class below. And they've done all sorts of different projects uh, that are really exceptional. So I, I think they're doing a great job. And now, now they're extending also into high schools because they see the need for getting high school kids motivated to come into the engineering school and, um, and, and hang in there and have hands-on support. I, I had showed you before the, uh, what we call the snow pixel that Bob Martin from Microchip had designed, and here's an example of, we had college students help solder them together, and then they were made into ornaments, and they were on display from uh, after Thanksgiving through January at Christmas in the Park in San Jose. And during the fall, I actually taught at a East San Jose school that was kind of underrepresented, lots of Latino, Latina, never programmed, no access to technology, teachers in their school. And I went in uh, twice a week to teach all the seventh graders to program these baubles, and then those were the kids that had theirs on display. And we had another volunteer guy in the Bay Area who was retired who did it for some Catholic charity schools, also underrepresented. So they actually had five Christmas trees full of these, these snow pixel things on display. Optiv is a team led by an assistant superintendent in Novi Public Schools in Upper Michigan, or in, uh, no, near Detroit, Detroit, Michigan. And they're doing a fantastic job of, of analyzing all sorts of products and then bringing them into, putting them into the kit and, and letting people try it. So that, this isn't the final version, but basically that's their idea. Uh, Platform.io is just one of my favorite development tools. I thought I would mention it here. <laughs> Ivan Kravitz, who's in the Ukraine does a fantastic job, and you have an installation, uh, just uh, installable extension on top of VS Code. It makes it really easy to work with microcontrollers. And then uh, Snap, I was mentioning Bernat Romagoza did Snap for Arduino. And this is a, I don't know if you can tell, but basically these blocks just allow kids to use like two potentiometers to control drawings on the screen. And you can add sounds, and you get a noise, and your lights, the kids, I taught this in the seventh grade class in the fall, and the kids just ate it up. They absolutely loved it, because not only are you seeing and hearing things on the screen, but those Arduino buttons, I should have been on the Arduino tab, actually, um, are really easy to insert. You know, set the digital pin on and off, you see the blink stuff, and uh, here's the, the Y and X values that are based on the input of, of analog readings zero and five, so there were potentiometers on that. And then microblocks, so Snap for Arduino, one of the drawbacks is that uh, you have to be connected, your microcontroller board has to be connected to your PC. It, it runs through a protocol called Fermata. 
what they're doing now is, is Bernat's working with John Maloney and Jens Monig, one of the developers, uh, uh, the main developer, Snap, and John is implementing a virtual machine to run on the, at least the 32-bit MCUs that will run these blocks on the, on the microcontroller such that when you disconnect your laptop, your blocks will still run. Not only that, but if you hand your device to somebody else and they plug it back in, then your code, it's almost like view source, shows up in the editor so that you can hand it off, you know, help kids help each other. Um, here's my code, you know, take it and run with it. So it reminds me of a little bit of the micro bit stuff, but uh, it, it's, it's gonna be awesome when, that, when that's ready. Orange is a kind of a foundation of some people I work with that are in the wiring crowd and trying to say, where are we gonna take this framework that was built off wiring in Arduino and how can we take it farther? I'd like to take it to IoT, and this is basically my last slide, is where I am now as we're working on this thing's gateway for Raspberry Pi. We wanna build libraries to make it easy to adapt things into it, so that's why we were talking to Microblocks, so they can have Web Thing API libraries right there for people to easily tie, it, tie those things into the, into the gateway. And the, the gateway, the Pi is just an example. We have it ported now to OpenWT, so you can run it on that, or any Linux, laptop basically could run the gateway software as well. So thank you again. And uh, now I think I will, will, there's time for questions. Thank you. So thanks for your talk. Uh, one thing you mentioned was um, hardware designs that were basically borrowed or ripped, ripped out by other vendors who would do it for cheaper, usually with uh, worse components that would fail or even missing stuff sometimes. So not only are they undercutting the person who did the work, but they're actually causing extra support from people who thought they got the real board and it's actually not working. So you, you said it was a problem, but What's the solution to this, if any? Well, there's, there's two types of solutions. One is if they're just copying the design but using their own brand, then you as the original developer you know, have to say, hey, you know, the, this really is a lesser quality implementation and watch out for X, Y, Z, or use the community to point that out. You know, it's be, it'd be better if we as the community members pointed out but some of them go even further. When I was at Arduino, we'd have the distributors like on Amazon would point out and they had to keep going to Amazon to have the clones pulled off of the store because not only were they copying the design, they were printing the Arduino Italy symbol and it wasn't <laughs> coming from the plant that was making the real Arduino. So uh, that's when it gets really hard. I mean, it's just basically counterfeiting and trying to stop that is pretty difficult, um, and you know I don't know how to get the consumers to 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 help identify that. But it's one of those conscious conscious choosers things, like how can we identify the copycats that are truly just trying to rip off the the person who owns the copyright and stuff. I, I don't have a strong answer, but um, it's something that we should try to have better relationships with. Uh, the different places where some of these copies are coming out of and develop some sort of a valuable incentive for them to make money off of you know, comparable hardware where they can keep the cost low, you know, because having lower cost hardware is good, but yeah, don't have a great answer, sorry. Um. How do I get involved, especially in the Mozilla IoT thing? Yeah, well, there is a URL right there, iot.mozilla.org. That's one step. We have a public IRC channel, um, a mailing list, which hasn't been used much. But it's, and, uh, and I'm hoping that with our 0 0.3 launch, we can really launch it with a bigger community, and also with the port to OpenWT, we can reach into other communities. But you are more than welcome. And, uh, and now that we have virtual things, that also keeps that creates a, lowers one of the barriers because one of the reasons that people didn't, even if they set up a gateway, why they didn't keep it active is you have to buy these expensive Z-Wave and Zigbee adapters. Now with virtual things, and now we have some adapters for just Wi-Fi and hopefully Bluetooth soon, you'll be able to buy 
or use your own cheap things. I mean, my, my whole dream is I want to make my own things and then create, you know, the thing API. It's basically a description with JSON objects. It's plain JSON is, is the spec. And also, you know, check out the spec, make comments, all the issues. You can post issues on um, the GitHub account as well. Thanks. Okay, one more back there, and then we'll come up to the front. Um, do you think we'll ever see the Star Auto being produced? <laughs> That's a great question. So the Star Auto was the one that, uh, you know, that lamp and the dress, flashy dress was based off of, ST Microelectronics. I don't know the answer to that, because I'm not involved at the Star Auto, but I would imagine if, if they went through all the work to build that design that, uh, they will try. The, the question is um, probably a matter of resources. You know, they can only do a few things at a time, and they're going to do things that are already tried and true. But if, if anything, I think ST, you know, ST Microelectronics should probably try to encourage other people to create those designs. I wish, I wish they would do more of that themselves. The, the silicon vendors um, make open designs. I had that on some of my slides. Make open designs that other people can build on and copy on so you can have fun things to do with the chips. We got one up front. Uh, thank you, Kathy. Fabulous talk. Um, what hope do you have that the, the Mozilla Web Things framework will be a solution to fragmentation rather than a, a 15th or 16th fragment? Um, yeah, the, the classic, I remember the, the cartoon, which has 15 standards and then there's the 16th. I'm less inclined to think that it's the be all and end all of the standards of the API. I'm more interested in the, in the how of just create, making it easier for web developers to consume thing data. So the powerful thing to me is less how we actually construct the schema, because there's still some, you know, there's all been so schema work in OCF and schema work in all these other organizations. We don't want to throw that away. But I'm hoping that if there's a technical implementation that will drive more of the eventual API standardization, that all of these things should come together. There shouldn't be uh, one and another, and then you have to build bridges between the two. But the important thing to me is just turn things into web things, get that data accessible, and then also, you know, we want to instill our values on that, on that gateway so that it is a personal and private space for, for you to own those, that thing data. Thank you so much, Kathy. And I'd like to give you this on behalf of the organizers wow. to thank you for all of the time and effort that you put into that amazing talk. So let's hear it for Kathy.